welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have that wonderful pleasure of looking together into the Word of God and then trying to understand as much as we can the truth of the Word of God. Oh my, when we come to truth, it's because we find harmony with everything that might relate to the subject at hand as we go through the Bible. Now again, this is Monday and we're uh, giving a kind of a quick outline of where our our caravan is, is going this next week uh, because this gives an opportunity for those who are living in those cities or near those cities who would like to take part in the caravan activity and assist in passing out tracks, uh, they can know when the caravan will be in their city. And if you have any questions about this, uh, and if you do wish to uh, to uh, get more information, just call 1-800-543-1495 and ask for caravan information. And uh, there will be somebody there that hopefully can help you or uh, take your call. And that's 1-800-543-1495. Now, uh, we have several caravans out right now. Uh, one is in, uh, right now, is in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, it's here, uh, to, it'll be there t- uh, through tomorrow. And then on Thursday, it will go to uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama. And it'll be there till Saturday. And then this coming Sunday through Tuesday, it will be going to Montgomery, Alabama. Then on Wednesday through Saturday, it will be in Atlanta, Georgia. Then we have some other uh, cities that are covered by a caravan. Right now, it's it's uh, it's uh, on Friday. It will be in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And on Monday, or, or excuse me, on Wednesday through Friday, I didn't say that correctly. On Wednesday through Friday, Friday it'll be in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then on Monday next week, it will be in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, then there's another caravan that's under the supervision of eBible Fellowship, and uh, they will... Uh, be in Hartford, Connecticut, and Springfield, Massachusetts on uh, Monday through uh, uh, Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday. Well, now, wait a minute. Today is Monday, so it'll be tomorrow. They'll be still in uh, Hartford and Vernon, Connecticut, and Springfield, Massachusetts. On Wednesday, they'll be going to uh, North Hampton, uh, Northampton, uh, Massachusetts, and then on Thursday, they're going to Rutland and Burlington in Vermont. Then on Friday, they're going to be in Lebanon, Hanover, and Manchester, New Hampshire, the Lord willing. On Saturday, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Freeport and Portland, N.E. I don't... No, what, uh, what those, the, what state the initials N E are of? I'm sorry, I've, it's been a long time since I took fourth grade ge- geography. And then on Sunday, they'll be uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, on s- this coming Sunday. We also have another caravan that is uh, headed down right now uh, to Los Angeles, and uh, from Monday, that is uh, from tonight. And all the way through Saturday, they're going to be in the Los Angeles, California area. And on uh, then on Sunday through Thursday, they will, uh, that's next week, they'll be in the San Diego, California, uh, Ca- California area. And on Friday, they're going to be going to Phoenix. So that by, from Saturday to Wednesday of, uh, they, of the 26th of March to the 30th of March, they will be in Phoenix, Arizona. And so if you have any interest in, in knowing more about this, just call our, our uh, number 1-800-543-1495 and ask for 
caravan information. Incidentally, we are still, we can still use some more drivers, both uh, for the whole long haul, which is only nine, ten weeks now, and will be the end. And also, we have room for for uh, some drivers who uh, who can only spend maybe two to three weeks with the caravan. And you can call the same number in at one eight hundred five four three fourteen ninety five and leave your name and uh, and someone will get back to you for with information. But thank you. And now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Welcome to Open Forum. God bless you, sir. Yes, welcome to Open your, Forum. Appreciate your efforts in the Lord. Could you share with me, Brother Camping, when you multiply the three times the 7,000, where is the three coming from biblically? What scripture might I reference to that? Multiply three times. Why would you want to multiply three times 7,000? Why would you want to do that? There, that's not that that particular number uh, comes up. Or no, let me see. No, it doesn't come up anywhere that I'm aware of in the Bible. There's seven thousand years, right to the exact oh. year from from the flood. Uh, I'm the sorry, sir. I made a mistake. I meant to say the seven billion people in the world. Yes. Multiply by the three, showing that many are called, fewer chosen. Where are you getting that number three? Oh, that it's it's the other way around. I'm There's, sorry, sir. We do find in Zechariah chapter thirteen where God divides the, the human race into thirds. Uh, we if, let me go to Zechariah chapter thirteen. It's not multiplying by three. It's it's multiplying by one third. We find in Zechariah chapter thirteen, um, it shall come to pass, verse eight. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith Jehovah, two parts thereof shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. In other words, there are three parts. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say that when we come to the end, there will be about seven billion people. That is, the number seven is heavily featured as we come to the end for many different reasons. But it, but we don't read that in the Bible about seven billion people. That's just kind of an extra, extra gift God has given to us that it turns out that, yes, uh, 2011 comes at a time in that, that during that year, the world is going to feature, uh, have 7,000 pe billion people in it. And uh, basically, if you go to the World Almanac right today, you'll find that, that, uh, and uh, as we, as it, as it counts all the people in the various nations and the number who are enrolled in some kind of a, a church that features Christ, that about one third are featured by Jesus Christ, are in that kind of a church, and about two thirds are outside. And we also know when we're looking at our uh, uh, our Bible very carefully that those in the churches, except for a very tiny number, are on their way to Judgment Day. How horrible that is to think about! But that is very clearly what the Bible does teach. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camp in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. Let's look at that. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. And then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, what is your question? Okay, Brother Kemp, and I've been hearing a lot, you know, what these earthquakes taking place. The scientists are saying back in 2004, 
that when the earthquake in Thailand happened, it sped up the Earth's rotation six point something microseconds, and this one that happened in Japan sped up the Earth's rotation one point something microseconds. Now, is this another one of God's prophecies happening? Because the scientists said with the Earth's rotation being sped up, I'm that we are having the days are being shortened. I'm sorry so, that that uh, those two earthquakes. It did occur, but I find nothing in the Bible that relates to those two earthquakes. And the, this is simply talking about the Great Tribulation, in which that we learn from the Bible when we finally understand it, is that 23-year period, 8,400 days exactly, that began in 1988 and concludes in, on May 21 in 2011. And it began with 2,300 days when virtually nobody was saved. It was a terrible, terrible time. Uh, but it looked like God's salvation plan had come to an end. And, and yet for the sake of the elect, that is, there were still people that had to become saved that had not even been born yet. Uh, during the final 17 years of the history of the world. And so for the sake of the elect, the, the terrible nature of the Great Tribulation was modified after the first 2,300 days so that outside of the churches there could still be many becoming saved. And that's been going on, although the terrible nature of the Great Tribulation continues for the full 8,400 days or the 23 years of the full of the uh, entire uh, uh, entire duration of the Great Tribulation. But it has nothing to do with earthquakes, this particular passage. Nothing at all. And in fact, when we read about earthquakes, we know that when the, when the end comes, there will be a great earthquake, and probably a whole se series of earthquakes going around the world. But... but uh, as the graves are thrown open so that the, the true believers can be caught up out of them and, and go into heaven and also the bodies or the remains of the unsaved can be thrown out uh, in order to be shamed in the eyes of God. Okay. Thank you, Brother Champion. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, the verse you were just speaking on, Matthew twenty four twenty two. Yes. Is there a possibility that that could be speaking on um, the days being shortened for the elect, meaning uh, the rapture, and um, that it doesn't, you know, it's not prolonged to the 21st? I don't oh, know no, it no, right, it but. can't possibly. It can't possibly. This, this, can, uh, this fig locks in very tight. In that, uh, in that there's a big change in the nature of the Great Tribulation after the first 2,300 days of it. There was no change in the churches, but outside of the churches, there was a great change because God again began to save uh, many people all over the world who were not in the churches. And the Bible has plenty of information that tie into that. Uh, there's no question that that is what is what is in view here? Okay, because I, I was just thinking that, um, I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly, but for the elect's sake, yeah, they're, well, they're the going to they're uh, gonna be ratcheted up on May 21st. You have and to. The days are shortened that they don't go into those five months and towards the no, end. No, it has nothing no to do to with that. It has nothing to do with that, that uh, the for the elect's sake, the... Uh, it has to do with the Great Tribulation. It's talking about the Great Tribulation. And right. after May 21, it's not the Great Tribulation that's in view anymore. It's Judgment Day. It's not saying that for the elect's sake they, they don't go into Judgment Day. It, uh, it, it's the shortening of the 23 years of the Great Tribulation. Very good. Thank you Thank for you. calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, Go ahead with your call. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. 
First Corinthians 15, where it's talking about we'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. Let me look at that in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, what is your question? Well, my focus is on that last trumpet there, and I also wanted to look at Revelation 11 and 15. In Revelation 11, 15, you want to look at that also. Revelation 11, 15. There we read 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, what is your question? Well, if there's uh, seven trumpets, and the last trumpet is blown on May 21st, catching up the saints to be with Christ in two months, shouldn't we be seeing other uh, six trumpets? turmoil and things happening now like spoken of in uh, Revelation 8-6? Well, no, you'll find that all the trumpets have to do with the Judgment Day. Let me see, I think I said that accurately. I uh, read, for example, we read in, in uh, the sixth thing, let's look at, well, let's look at the first, let's start with the first. Uh, and I saw and the smoke fan the angel took and let me see the first angel sounded that's in Revelation 8 and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast on, upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up now as soon as we read these third parts and that has to do with the second and the third and the fourth and fifth and so on it's all dealing with judgment day the seven tr uh, trumpets are all identified with Judgment Day. And, uh, and it's, we remember, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a literal trumpet that's going to blow. Or we're going to hear a big, actually, in the Old Testament, this kind of a trumpet would have been a ram's horn, just a great big blast, not a musical uh, trumpet at all. And, and but it's really emphasizing that the word of God, that is the trumpet, uh, as it sends forth there the message, and we have it recorded right here. And so what it's saying that as the seven trumpets are blowing, that is, it's saying that now the what God has declared or to, to, has to tell us about Judgment Day, this is what is what is going to be in view during Judgment Day. Okay, so so we're not literally. Is, is it a spirit? It's, a, it's, it's mostly a spiritual thing then, with the trumpets. Then also with the six trumpets and the seven. The seven yeah, trumpets I'm, I'm, have to do I'm, with Judgment Day, and it's the last trumpet also has to do with the fact that it's the it's the sounding of of the finality of all that that death is no longer. It's when when the seventh trumpet. When, when everything is done, judgment has, or, or uh, everything is annihilated, there's nothing remembered or come into mind, and then we, like we read in 1 Corinthians 16, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Because death has been thrown into the lake of fire, that is, it has disappeared with judgment day, that is, because once we get to the end of Judgment Day, which will be October 21, 2011, there will be never, never, never again any death anywhere because it's all been done and it's remembered no more. But okay. thank you. Well, uh, thank thank you. you for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, could you go to Leviticus 9, verses 6 through 10, and explain that to me? Yes, let's look at that. Leviticus 9, verse 6 to 10. We read Leviticus 9. And Moses said, This is the thing which Jehovah commanded that you should do, and the glory of Jehovah shall appear unto you. All right, let, let's, let me start with verse 5. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the congregation drew near and stood before Jehovah. Then Moses said, This is the thing which Jehovah commanded that you should do, and the glory of Jehovah shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar, and offer thy sin offering, and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for thyself and for the people, and offer the offering of the people, and make an atonement for them uh, as the Lord commanded. Uh, Aaron therefore went unto the altar and, and slew, that is, killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the call, that is some more fat around the liver of the sin offering, he burnt upon the altar as the Lord, as Jehovah commanded Moses. Now, what is your question? Well, I was wondering, what does it mean, um, the sacrifice and the blood and the, um, the gall? And well, you know... Yeah, when you go through the Bible, you'll find that there's extensive language about suffering, uh, offerings, sin offering, trespass offerings, peace offerings, uh, all kinds of different offerings, and it, they all involved. No, not all. There were even uh, offerings that were just meal offerings. There was no shedding of blood, but most of them had the shedding of blood. And uh, and uh, the blood represented the fact that death had to occur in making payment for sin. The offering was pointing to the method by which we could have our sins paid for, and that is by the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is because he died uh, uh, as he took the punishment on behalf of those he came to save. It was his blood that was shed and was typified by all of this blood. And the blood was everywhere. It was put on the altar. It was sprinkled on the people. It was, uh, it was every, blood, 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 blood. Uh, really, uh, when you read everything about all these offerings, you begin to think that the, the, uh, the temple where these offerings were, where the big altar was, was like a slaughterhouse because this had to go on day after day after day. Every single day, without exception, there were a minimum of at least two animals that were killed. And, and in many days, many, many more animals. And so it was, and always the blood, the blood is there. And it, it emphasized that it was indeed a terrible terrible, gory thing that Christ had to die to make payment for our sins because all of this was pointing to God himself shedding his blood. How could that be? We don't understand. But it was an enormous sacrifice on the part of God to make payment for our sins. Okay. Thank you very much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? (laughs) Welcome to Open Forum. Now, Mr. Camping? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, today I was at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. And they had all the bones of the dinosaurs. Yes. And on the bottom, four and a half million years old. Yes. So how can you say that the Earth is only 13,000 years? Well, now you see, these scientists, who they're revolutionary scientists, 
and they don't believe the Bible at all. That is not part of their, uh, their uh, research. Excuse me. They are I'm... they are do not believe the Bible at all. But the fact is, they have to figure out how in the world this world came into existence with its millions of complex life forms, and they have decided that the world is billions of years old, and uh, they have made, uh, they've tried to guess uh, 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 about this and about that, and then they trust in their guesses. As a matter of fact, this the, nobody can argue with this, but the invention of writing went, goes back no more than 5,200 years. There, and they have absolutely found no no archaeological evidence of writing earlier than about 5,200 years. Now, the writing was the only way that you could really test uh, about how old something is, because in the written documents of the old of the of archaeology, sometimes a reference was made to a moon. Uh, a moon eclipse or, a, or something of that nature and that could be coordinated with what astr astronomers know about that and so they could g they could tell uh, quite accurately uh, how old that archaeological piece was that they found but once they got earlier than 5200 years there was there is nothing absolutely nothing that can tell them how to tell earlier time and so they have to make guesses. They can measure the uh, amount of, uh, of uh, chemical in, in, in uh, various rocks of, uh, and ice and so on, but, uh, but they have to make guesses as to how it all began. And then they, then they make those guesses their authority. They trust in nothing, in other words. They, uh, they, it's the greatest me uh, situation of faith you can ever imaginable. Their faith is based on nothing. And yet they write about it like they know all about it. That is absolutely trustworthy. And so you go to that museum and you read that uh, little sticker. Hold on for just a moment. No, I dare say without, without, and I can, we can show that that evolutionary science that talks about millions of years and billions of years in the past is just one great big scam. There is no truth in it. Now, for example, just as an illustration, you can get a little booklet from Family Radio called Let the Ocean Speak. Now, the scientists have measured relatively accurately the amount of sediments and the chemicals in those sediments that flow into the ocean from all the rivers of the world. This is just a, a fact of measuring. And, and uh, where, does the, where do those sediments go? Well, obviously, they go on the ocean floor. And so now, if they measure how much in one year goes on the ocean floor of all these sediments, how much would go in one million years or in... Of uh, 80 million years, my, you would think that the ocean would be absolutely, uh, 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 there, there would have been the sediment would be thousands of, and thousands and thousands of feet deep. But the fact is, when they have checked the ocean floor, it is relatively free of sediments. Oh, there are sediments, but not, not thousands and thousands and thousands of feet. The sediment on the ocean floor agrees with what we learn from the facts, the facts of the Bible, that when coordinated with our calendar, the creation began 11,013 B.C. And, uh, you know, uh, you, these scientists, they, they're scared to death to, uh, to admit there is a God because then they know they're in trouble with God and and so they try desperately to pull this idea that we're millions and millions of years old and therefore also perhaps the world will go on for another millions of years. It's all, it's no, there's no truth in it. None, none 
I dare to say this very publicly, very publicly, because I, 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 I have checked on these things. And when you think of the millions of life forms, you, I, I use it again and again just the illustration of a common house fly. It's got, a, it's got two eyes, and each eye has got 4,000 lenses in it. Have you ever heard a scientist try to d tell you how that came to, uh, in existence in the last millions of years? It's ridiculous. It took a creator. Uh, when, when, when we are come up with all these magnificent things that are going on with communication, with TV and radio and and all kinds of things that I can't even talk about. And how did it come to pass? Because uh, by by somebody just waiting for millions of years for it to happen? No. Someone had to think it out and then design it and then make it and then and then correct it because it didn't work the first time but uh, but and keep working on it and the next thing you have an object you can use and that's exactly the way God created the world he spoke and he brought the world into existence it uh, it did not just come through long periods of time did you forget about carbon dating uh, 14 carbon dating, they can go back as far as the earth was made. And the scientists are not against river, uh, they're, uh, they're just telling it as it is, without the science. Uh, excuse me, carbon 14 dating is only accurate as far back as they can check it against written data. And any date that they date earlier than for, 5,200 years ago, and, and even then they find they have to make a correction to their carbon-14 date uh, because of what they learned from the written record. But once they go past that, they have absolutely no way to check their carbon-14 dating at all. Then they can go to potassium-argon dating. And the same thing there. There's a very definite break off for at 5200 years ago they have no way to check their car they they make guesses as to how it all started and based on those guesses which are pure guesses uh, they're not they're not uh, uh, trustworthy they're just guesses and uh, and they build their whole business on those guesses they're trusting in other words in nothing when we read the bible we are getting the information right from the mouth of god and every fact in the bible that we read about uh, is absolutely true and th trustworthy but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. Hi, I listened to you tonight, and uh, you said you've been saying May 21st is uh, the end. Now, what is the difference between May 21st and October 21st? What is going to happen in that time span? Well, there's a big difference. You know, the fact is that there are two aspects of God's salvation plan. It is a savor of life unto life and of death unto death. Uh, the, uh, the aspect of life unto life comes to an, to an absolute halt on May 21 because all of the people whom God saved who experienced life will have the completion of their life at that time. They will receive their glorified spiritual bodies and then they're going to be caught up right then and there to be with Christ in heaven. And, so uh, and the they'll always be there. But on the other hand, there's the other aspect that has to be completed. And that is death unto death. And so all of those who have not been saved, will still, that is those who are still living at that time, they will, uh, they will go through a period of five months 
which is an, uh, an aspect of the atonement, the uh, judgment day. And during that period, they will be shamed in the eyes of God. In fact, all those who have ever died before, their bodies will be thrown out of the grave and, and, uh, and uh, God will shame their bodies as they're lying all over, or their remains, whatever there is. Uh, they will they will be shamed in the eyes of God until finally, at the end of that five months period, then everything is going to be annihilated, and it'll never, never, never re- be remembered anymore. And so the day of judgment is, has nothing to do with salvation. Nothing to do. Well, during the day of judgment, the true believers are safe and secure in the arms of Christ. They, their salvation is, has, was completed on May 21, and they have nothing to do with judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Camping. Could you please read Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Let's look at that. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, what is that? What is your question? Please tell me, who were the false prophets then, and what false teachers are they talking about now? Anybody, anybody who is bringing a gospel that is not faithful to the Word of God. For example, this is a terrible thing, but this is a fact. You go into any church and you uh, you study very carefully what they understand about how we become saved, and you'll find in every case it's a uh, do-it-yourself salvation plan. Uh, the best that they can do is in some churches they say God gives you faith, and then you exercise that faith, and you become saved. And that means that God gives you strength, to, uh, and uh, so then you, you, you use your strength uh, that he has given you to achieve something, so we work together, me and God. And that is not salvation. Salvation is where God has done everything, everything, we made no contribution, and it was all done before he ever created the world. And uh, so anybody that has another kind of a salvation plan is in reality, and this is a horrible thing to say because it applies to all the churches and all the congregations, regardless of what denomination they might be. But that is exactly the way they are teaching today. Part of that verse where it says there was false prophets among the people when this was written. Who, 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 what false prophets are you talking about back then? Well, in that day, they, there was a, a there was a transition from the uh, Old Testament into uh, the church, the uh, time when God was working with the nation of Israel to represent the kingdom of God, and the New Testament. Now, for example. Here is Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. And uh, Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee. Uh, he was a teacher. He was a, he was a learned uh, scholar in, and a very honest learned scholar in the Jewish church. And yet he was a false prophet. He was bringing all kinds of ideas that were contrary to the Word of God. In fact, he was even hauling those who were following the true gospel into Jerusalem to have them interrogated. And if they didn't confess they were wrong, they were to be killed. So bad it was. And he was doing it very honestly. But he was false. And then God opened his spiritual eyes on the road to Damascus. And he learned that uh, that uh, what the truth was. 
And he was no longer a false prophet. He became the champion of the true gospel. But God had to make the change in his life. And for the, and once he began to follow the true gospel, then guess what happened to him? He is stoned and left for dead by the false prophets, his, his former friends, the, the, uh, the leaders of the Jews. And he was whipped again and again and again and, and beaten and uh, so on. Uh, life became terrible for him once he became a true prophet. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay, I have a very interesting question to ask you concerning First Thessalonians 5, verse 4, that I've never heard anybody ask you before. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, that is, uh, uh, it's talking here about uh, Christ coming as a thief in the night, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of day and are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, what is your question? Okay, um, I'm not saved. Now, when May 21st comes, if I am still not saved, I know that I will be beginning to experience the, the beginning of the Day of Judgment. Since I know this, can you explain to me how that day is going to overtake me as a thief in the night? How that will have overtaken me as a thief in the night? Yeah, well, if I know if, uh, if I'm not uh, saved uh, and, and on that day and I know um, that I'm going to face judgment, how is that day going to overtake me as a thief? Well, the fact is, I, I, you, you know, God is, is speaking about, about people who are convinced that Christ is going to come as a thief in the night. And if you go into any church, any church, and you ask them, uh, when is, can we know when Christ is coming? Any denomination, and they'll say, we can't know that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And then you ask him the next question, well, if he does come whenever he comes, are you ready? Oh, yes. And they're answering, what is said here, peace, and I'm at peace and safety. And then God says, sudden destruction will come upon them. Now, it doesn't mean that if we do know that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, that we have become saved. There will be some of those people also that will be overtaken by judgment day because that is not the full assessment of what constitutes salvation. It isn't simply knowing that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, and not as a thief in the night. It also means that God has given us a new heart so that we have an intense desire uh, to want to do the will of God. And, uh, and, we, we, and that, that, uh, that only comes when God saves us. And everybody, there will be people who uh, truly believe that, that Christ is coming May 21 who are still not saved. And, and uh, we have to leave that to God altogether. So, so the people who, who aren't saved, but they, but they do know that Christ is coming, are you saying that they are still going to be overtaken as a thief in the night? No. Well, there, you see, this is not giving us a, a uh, criteria or a, a standard by which we can measure salvation. This okay. is simply indicating that there are two kinds of people that will be in the, in the world. One is that they, those who are true believers uh, and who understand that Christ is not coming as a thief in the night. They're children of the light. And the other is that there are a great many people who uh, insist that, no, we can't know he's coming as a thief in the night. But that, that is not, this is not a measuring stick for every situation. And okay. In fact, the Bible says when we, when we know that he's coming 
and we believe it with all our heart, we still, that doesn't mean we're saved. We can pray to God, oh God, have mercy, have mercy. We at least then will be in a position where we are coming broken before God, have mercy. Is it possible that I too might become saved? And it all depends on God's program and not upon anything that we do. But at least we're in the environment where there's a possibility of salvation, whereas those in the churches who are, and they are not saved, and yet they're not in the environment of wanting, of becoming saved. They are convinced that we can't even know when he is coming. There's no hope for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Yes, go ahead with your call. Uh, how are you doing? Good evening. I'm, I'm calling because I have a question. Where in the Bible does it have the location of why churches shouldn't be standing still today? Of why churches should not be standing still you, what do you mean standing still you mean why why churches are are not faithful to the word of god what what, what is your question i'm sorry let me rephrase that what i mean is where is it does it say that i don't have to, or i'm not I, I don't i'm not forced to go to church today where the, the the gospel should be praised in the house not that I'm forced to go well, to church well the bible doesn't use that kind of language the bible says in first exam for example in second thessalonians chapter 2 god says in verse 3 uh, let uh 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 it says, let no man, I'm reading Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the judgment day, and the, and the catching up of the true believers, which are simultaneous events, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now we can show that the man of sin is Satan. And it says here, Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, in that he as God sitteth in the temple. Now to sit in the Bible is a figure of speech, means to rule. The temple is the place where the Bible is, and that's in the churches. And now Satan is sitting there. He is ruling there uh, and showing himself that he is God. Uh, he is, uh, and we're like we read, God talks about that in Second Corinthians 11. Uh, Satan as, as a... As an angel of light, he looks just like Christ. That is, he he comes with a gospel that looks just like it's beautiful and wonderful. The blood, talking about the blood of Christ and so on, uh, but he is it's total sham. It is total deception. And he, but then it goes on, and his ministers of righteousness, the ministers in those churches, have become. His followers, they are worshiping Him. Even though they have been deceived, they think they're worshiping Christ. And, uh, and therefore, God says, when you, like in Matthew 24, verse 15, He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that is Satan, Satan sitting in the holy place. The holy place is where the Bible is. That's where the temple, where he is called the temple here. Then let those who are in Judea, and Judea is a figure of those who are in the kingdom of God, flee to the hills. Get out of there. The hills or the mountains have to do with Christ. As we read in Psalm 121, to the hills or to the mountains, I will lift up mine eyes from whence cometh my help. It, uh, and there are other passages that tell us get out of the churches because if you remain there, you are going to be worshiping Satan. Can you think of anything more horrible than that? And so, uh, but uh, uh, just because we get out of the churches, that doesn't mean no, no, I know I'm saved. It simply means that we're now in an environment 
where God still is saving, whereas in the churches, he is not saving any longer because Christ, who is, and the Holy Spirit, who saves people, has, has left the church and replaced their, themselves with Satan, who obviously cannot save anyone and actually will uh, lead people away from the truth as far as possible. So is that why we see female pastors? The, well, the fact is, whether whether you're a male or a female pastor, or whether you've been a pastor a long time or a short time, if you are still preaching in a church, you are a servant of Satan. Oh my! It just—it's. I cringe when I say that, but that is the fact. That is the fact. Satan is the ruler there. God teaches that in the Bible, and uh, and uh, therefore. It's a terrible thing to be a pastor who is really representing Satan. And he thinks with all his heart, with all his heart, he really thinks he's representing Christ. And he's not representing Christ at all. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. I have... Two scriptures that I would like to read. Well, no, let's First take... First one let's... is Acts, chapter, four, chapter 1, verse Acts, 4 to 8. Acts, chapter 1, 4 to 8. Let's look at that. I Acts. want to read it for myself. Excuse me. Let's read it so that everybody can hear it very clearly. Acts, chapter 1, verse 4 to 8. And being assembled I together... I want to read it, campaign. Excuse me. I... I, will I want read. to read the verses of Scripture. Well, why do you want to read it? You, 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 well, we, excuse, you excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. You have a question, and I am going to read this, and then you ask your question. And if you don't like this arrangement, I'm sorry, then you will go on to the next caller. Now, you have to make up your mind. But we want this scripture to be very carefully read. You were just talking Acts about chapter delivery. 1, verse 4. They, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Whence they therefore, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, what is the other scripture you wanted to look at? The other scripture is Acts chapter 4, verse 5 to 12. Well, I don't know. We're reading an awful lot of scripture. Let's let me look. Let me look and see what that's covering. That's the text camping. Uh, 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 what what is what is the verse that you want to take out of Acts four verse five to twelve? I uh, want you to read. I uh, read seven to twelve. Read seven to twelve. Seven to twelve. There oh, we read. Cunning man. Let let me. All right, let's. And when they were had set them in the midst, they asked, uh, uh, let me start, let's start back at verse 5. We have to get the context. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Remember, the high priests are still following the Jewish religion, not the religion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they had set them in the midst of them, that is the 
uh, the disciples, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, please, what is your question? In Acts 1, he stated to them who the Father was, and the understanding of who he is, when they waited on, on the upper room... I, I'm says, sorry, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're going to have to go to our break. Each weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. God does not need the prayers of His people to do His will, and yet, in God's wisdom, He has decided to use the conversations He has with His people to accomplish His will. This statement from the booklet, We Talk to God in Prayer, emphasizes the fact that God does not need the prayers of His people, but that He chooses to use prayer to involve them with Himself and with His most important work of salvation. This brief Bible study examines many facets of prayer in the light of Holy Scripture. For your free copy of the booklet, We Talk to God in Prayer, call 1-800-543-1495. That's one 800 Five four three fourteen ninety five, or write to Family Radio, Oakland, California, nine four six two one. We continue with more of the Open Forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is one eight hundred three two two five three eight five. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We have a caller on the line, and I'm going to ask you to ask your question very quickly and very clearly with no more explanation or else we'll go to our next caller. Please, here you're going to try to use these verses maybe to say that are your question, are these verses teaching that Christ, after all, is not quite the Father? Is that what you're trying to say? I want to ask my question, but you don't allow anyone... Excuse me, what is your question? I'm allowing you to do that. Now go ahead, please. please. Well, I want you to give me a chance to answer you. The question is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the Bible, the whole Listen Bible. Listen to this man. Listen to him. That is your. That's the answer. That's the, that's the answer you gave me, Camping. What no. does First Corinthians fifteen one to three says? That's the reason why I wanted to read the scriptures. Yeah, well, excuse I me. I, I, I'm sorry. Involved. I'm sorry. We're not going anywhere. We're just going. You're, you've asked your question, and I have given you the answer. And so we're going to go to our next caller. I'm sorry. But shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I had a question about uh, the gospel. My question is... As I look around and I see all the Bibles that are put out today, I've always been raised that King James is the only Bible to use. And uh, I tried to read the others, but I see that certain words that are twisted 
and change, not twisted, but they're changed, and it, it kind of changed the meaning of the of the verse. Is it is it safe to say only Bible to actually read is the King James? Well, the King James turns out to be the most accurate of all the Bibles that are available, although it's not the easiest to read because it does have some old English in, and and we kind of like some of these other translations because they don't use the old English. But but uh, the real issue is not what I'm reading, but what am I really listening to? The... Uh, even if you're listening to a Bible that is not quite as accurate as the King James, still there's so much in it that is true. And the, the issue is, what am I real? How, how do I look at the Bible? Do I realize that in the original language, every word came from the mouth of God? And therefore, everything in the Bible is super, super important. And then if we really get insistent on wanting to know as much truth as possible, then we want to use the King James. And then on top of that, if we're a teacher of the Bible, we don't even trust the King James. We go back to the original language and, and double check what the, how God used that particular uh, uh, English word in the, or Greek word in the Bible or how he used that particular, uh, Hebrew word in the Bible, and so it gets kind of, but, but the real issue is, do we start out with the principle that what I'm reading here, uh, in the original language, it was right from the mouth of God, and I tremble before it, because even though I might have an inferior translation, it's still got a, a plenty of truth in it that came right from the mouth of God, and and my attitude toward the Bible becomes very important. And with that kind of attitude, then, of course, the next thing you're going to say, well, then I might as well use a King James Bible, because that will get me a little closer to truth. That's correct, because I'm a firm believer, if you want to learn about the Gospel, then you will have to learn a little bit and try to understand Old English instead of making it easier for you to understand, yeah. if that makes any sense. Well, thank you so much for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Yes, Prince. go ahead with your call. Um, I called you up a little over a month ago, and um, I brought up a couple of verses, one in Luke and one in Isaiah. And to me, I see a relation between the two. Uh, you don't see that relation. And the one in Luke, I'd have you look again in your own time, uh, that's 2111, just in your own time. I don't want to get into it right now, but actually the the terrors, uh, excuse me, the, the terrifying things or the terrifying sights, the word sights shouldn't be there. I looked at the Greek on that. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm that. sorry. What verse are you looking at? Well, I didn't want to get into that, though, right now. Oh, okay. Well, I want then you to look at. What is There's your question? Verse. Okay, my question is, is that you had stated that the verse in... Isaiah 66 that states that God comes back, Jesus will return, which blew my mind when I read this, that he's going to That God comes period. back and, excuse me, a verse, you, are, you want to look at a, Isaiah 66 and which no. verse? No, I'm going to point something out, Brother Camping, please, give me a chance, please. I pointed out this verse in 66 in Isaiah states that when the Lord returns, he will return with his chariot. And that caught my eye. And I called you up and I brought that up to you that, that it seems to me that that's what Luke 21 is stating. Well, and excuse said, no, me, no. excuse me. You are making statements. What, what verse are you talking about that he's going to return in, in Isaiah 66 with Jared? We have to look at that verse. We can't just talk kind of around it. We, uh, what is your question? It's, it's, you believe that the chariots that God or Jesus is going to return with is a spiritual thing. What do you make of Second Kings six seventeen, please? Second Kings chapter six verse seventeen, where we does that where it's talking about uh, Elijah going up in a chariot of fire. No. Second, let, let me That's see, Church. Second Kings chapter six verse. 17 
And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And Jehovah opened. Oh, uh, oh no, that is a different statement. And the Lord and Jehovah opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, what now is your question, question? My question is, were those real, or was that just something spiritual? Oh, that is uh, that that he in this in this vision he saw real chariots. But that doesn't mean that there were real chariots out there, uh, physical, literal chariots, but it was what God caused him to see his chariots out there. Uh, that's, okay. that's very obvious from the context. Okay. Now, if you go back to Luke 21.11, I don't see how you can say that that is, that that is something that is not of the same nature. Because that is saying almost the same thing. And if you do a Greek study on this, look at the Greek on this very carefully. Luke 22, you want to look at, and he, Luke Luke 21, 21, verse 11, there we read, And great earthquakes shall be in the diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs there shall be from heaven. Oh, oh, that's so 21. Or you want 22 or 11. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And ye shall... Uh, uh, you, it's in Luke... Or no, you want 2111. Okay, that's what I was reading. Luke 2111. And great... And uh, it's saying against in verse 10, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in different places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs there shall be from heaven, and before all these they shall lay hands on you, and so on. Now, what is your question? Well, my qu- this is what I'm pointing out, is that that's a bad translation. When it says there shall be great sights, the word sights should not be there. It should be... There shall be great and terrible, or great and, I, I forget the terminology there, but both, it, the, the word both is not translated. It should be both great uh, terrors and signs from heaven. Now, what I'm saying is that God, he doesn't have to have literal things that people are seeing, but if there are spiritual sights, and this is it's separated from the, the like, just it's, it's very similar to when Jesus had told the apostles that when the the end comes, it'll be like the days of Noah, and things just seem to continue. And people don't take it to heart that this end is coming, and and they just keep getting married, and and life just goes on. Well, well, it, it, is is your question really then that uh, we God has already given us many fearful signs from heaven? The fact of the Great gay pride movement is a sign from heaven that God has uh, delivered the world up to that kind of sinful activity. The the sign that the churches are all uh, that are all holding to the fact that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, and yet they're convinced they're saved. That is a sign from heaven. It's a spiritual sign, and there are many other signs that God has given us. Now, insofar as how literal this will become, we don't know. We don't have any clear language. We, 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 we I, I don't like to speculate, and I, it may be before Judgment Day is finally here, May 21 is here, there, it may be that there still might be some physical signs that there are some language that is, that allows that possibility, but nothing that clearly, that we can clearly say, yes, we know that too is going to happen. And, uh, and I, 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 I try, we should try not to speculate any, uh, uh, as, as little as, we should speculate as little as possible because, uh, you, Everything is so horrible and so terrible and so fantastic and so tremendous and so awesome about all this time in which we're living. And we can really get it carried, carried away on these things. And so we have to be very, very careful and very modest before we start uh, looking at something as that's actually going to happen. Like earthquakes, for example. 
Lots of people do a lot of things with earthquakes, but when you make an honest study, you'll find that on the average, there are no more earthquakes today than at any other time in the history of the world on the average. And, uh, and uh, no, uh, they've, they've had bigger earthquakes than we have today. And so we, we, got, we have to be very careful that we don't just uh, get excited about this, but be, be very mature and, and, and wait for, as God, God will, when the time comes, God will reveal more to us if there's more for us to know. But it's also, also very healthy to say it is possible that this could happen, but not that where it is actually going to happen. Thing, please. But thank you. I, 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 may I say one other thing? Just one other thing. I agree with what you just said. It, it all makes sense, and I, I also think that same way. But why would God tell us this unless he expected us to study and figure out what he is talking about? Because I don't see it as simply as you, for instance. I don't see gay pride as being a frightening thing. Yeah, well, it I is a, it I is understand a, the it is a hor- excuse. It depends on how you're looking at it. Gay pride, a sign like that is a horribly frightening thing because it guarantees that we're right on the threshold of Judgment Day. It isn't the gay pride that's that that is frightening. It's the fact that it's pointing to the frightening event that we're at the end, and every sign is pointing to it. It depends on how we're looking at these signs. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campy. Yes. How are you? Very well, thank you. I wanted to just make a suggestion with respect to the um, Open Forum. I know you've been doing a good job for many years. We've learned tremendously from it. But since we're coming down to the end times, would you not, would you consider not doing the open forum, but using the time to air studies or go back on questions that people have answered that you may want to take a little more time to explain? Because I find now that what's happening is that people are getting agitated. You're getting agitated yourself. And, you know, the tone of it is different. Because people are calling in with questions or not adhering to the well, rules. I, I, you know. And so you spend a little more time getting frustrated, trying to answer them. And so before it turns out into be a, a, a program where people are agitated and you're agitated, why not no, use uh, the rest of the time? Me. To uh, excuse me. Excuse, excuse me. Uh, the fact is that uh, we do teach. We have programs like Family Bible Study and others that teach without anybody calling in we just plainly teach but you know this open forum is a is a real uh, asset because it gives people an opportunity to ask a question that is not covered very carefully in something that has already been taught or has not been heard and while they're asking their question they're speaking for many many others who have the same kind of a question. And the wonderful advantage of those questions is that it also causes those who believe they have the truth, like myself, uh, to uh, look again to make sure uh, we have the truth. In other words, we, we, uh, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity uh, to, uh, to examine what we're teaching and, and Put it to the test to any kind of a question that people ask. Now, I know that some of our listeners maybe get a, a little bit jaded with, with a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of this kind of discussion, and I'm sorry, but I, I really believe that it is a, a tremendous asset to truth because I, I, don't, I don't ever want to trust me. I want to trust the Bible, and somebody out there may have a better in- insight then I, then the Lord has guided me into, and I want to know about that. And at the same time, the Lord may have guided me into a better insight than somebody else, and and they and they should know about that. So while it is a, it is a cumbersome in some ways, and but I'll tell you, I don't get frustrated. I'm not frustrated by any of these callers, not at all. I'm simply seeking a way to use them uh, to. Uh, to make our program 
profitable. And sometimes that's pretty hard to do because they're very insistent that they have some words that they want to say which is not proper or it's not, we don't have the time or the, or the, it is not the way this program is designed. But thank you for your thoughts and shall we take our next call, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, could you please read First Thessalonians 5, 5, please? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, there we read. Uh, ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, what is your question? I think the, a previous caller made a good point. Uh, God is speaking of two types of people here, children of the day and children of the night, um, saved and unsaved. It, there's no, um, how should I say it, there's no distinction between people that go to a church or people outside of a church. It's just saved and unsaved that God is concerned with here in this chapter. Well, except except in this passage, God is not, first of all, addressing whether you're saved or unsaved. He's addressing what do you think about the timing of his coming. He is saying here, he's beginning in verse 2 with the principle that every church correctly had learned from the Bible that during the church age, Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And, and, and until 1988, there is nobody in the whole wide world, in the church or any other place, could know when Christ is coming. And so he starts out, uh, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But now he begins to develop something here that there are two kinds of people we're talking about a, 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 a very curious situation. For when they shall say peace and safety, or, or uh, excuse me, yeah, for when they, that is those who talk about Christ coming as a thief in the night, which was absolutely correct throughout the church age until 1988, when they shall say peace and safety, that is if you ask them, but are you ready? to uh, be with Christ when he comes, whenever he comes as a thief in the night. And they say yes. And so that immediately is identifying with all the churches. We all, any of us who've ever been in a church or visited a church, know that that is very true. And then it says uh, 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 that then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What in the world is God talking about? He's talking about those in the churches who've been trained that Christ is coming as a thief in the night and who've been trained to believe that they have truly become saved. And now he's saying sudden destruction. Uh, destruction is coming upon you. So in the next verse, God indicates there's something happened. There's a change that's been made. Yea, brethren, there's, these are other people now. These are not people in who are believing that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, and yet they're safe and secure. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. Ye are not of the night nor of darkness. Uh, in other words, there's another group who, who, are, who know that he's not coming as a thief in the night. And... and uh, and, uh, and they are the ones who are watching. And when we look at that word watch and compare that with other verses, like in the last verse of Mark chapter 13, God tell, commands us, watch, watch. Why? Why? Because Revelation 3 verse 3 says, uh, uh, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In other words, uh, if you are watching, he will not come upon you as a thief. And so that is the way we have to read First Thessalonians 5. 
And thank you for calling and sharing your question. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brad. Brad, I go camping. Could yeah. we please look at two verses? Uh, the first is Second Samuel 24, verse 18. All right, let's look at that. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. There we read... 24, verse 18. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto Jehovah in the threshing floor of of uh, Arona, the Jebusite. Gad is the prophet of the Lord who's coming to King David with that particular command. Oh, okay, and may we please look at Matthew 3, verse 12. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. And there we read, who's it's talking about... Uh, uh, let, let's start with verse 11 so we pick up the context. I indeed baptize you with water, that John the Baptist speaking, unto repentance. But ye that come, he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and with fire. Whose, and here's verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, what is your question? Uh, yes, right. Uh, yes, that, that, that uh, with the threshing floor, that, that, that that's where the right, wheat is tossed up, up, up and down to separate the uh, grain from the uh, chaff. So my uh, question is, is right, uh, uh, with the great earth earthquake on May 21, uh, is that right, uh, spirit, 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 virtually speaking, is that where God is, is, is separating that, that the, that the wheat, that the true, the no. true believers. No, no, that is not the time of separation. Well, it is a separation at that time, but that, when God is talking about, go, go back to Revelation chapter 3. <coughs> Revelation chapter 3. Okay. And, and we read there, uh, it talks there about a time of testing in verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. This is Revelation 3, verse 10. And it's talking about true believers. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I shall also keep thee from the hour of temptation. That is really the hour of testing, which shall come upon all the world to try them that, that dwell upon the earth. Now tie that with Matthew chapter 13. Remember the parable of the wheat and tares? And the wheat is is separated from the tares, and it's uh, the wheat is brought into the barn, and the tares are brought are put into bundles to prepare for the burning. And that period of testing is not judgment day. That period of testing is the great tribulation. That period that we're going through right now, where the where the elect of God, who are the true believers, are being separated from those who claim to be true believers and are not at all, they uh, and they think they are. And so they're, the true believers are being more secure than ever in, uh, in, in with Christ. They are, are more determined than ever that all they want to do is be faithful to the Word of God, whereas the tares, they are uh, being uh, locked together in... in in, uh, and they are, they're not giving in at all on their doctrines. They're absolutely saying Christ is coming as a thief in the night. They're, they're not changing any of their church doctrines, no, no matter if they're correct or not, because they are prepared 
for going into the burning. That is to go into the day of judgment. And that matches First Thessalonians 5 where it says that those who, who believe he's coming as a thief in the night and yet they're ready, sudden destruction will come upon them. The testing or the separating is going on right now. At Judgment Day on May 21, the, the separation has all been done and it's just final, finalized as the true believers, the elect of God, are caught up to be with Christ in heaven. And the unsaved are left here, are left here uh, to endure the days of, ju- of Judgment Day. But now we've come to the end of our time and I have to say good night. <laughs>